Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to stage Scott Wingo, CEO of Channel Advisor. How's everybody doing? Good, good. So one of the things that we get feedback from from previous Catalyst is you're giving me all this big picture information and I take it home and I don't know where to start. You've told me about mobile and social and if I'm not on Amazon, I should be there and, and whatnot. Um, and so what we've done is we've added a session this year that's 100% tactical. So those things are strategic and, and great. But what we also want to do is give you some tips that you will go home and you can implement and you know, usually in a week or two is kind of the guideline that we've given our folks uh, and that they will help grow your business. So, so that's really the spirit of this session. Uh, and to help me kick it off, uh, I have some of our experts from Channel Advisor that I'll, I'll bring out here on stage. First we have, I've totally forgotten the order. Uh, let's see, so, so Amy Lubell. Welcome to Amy. She's our marketplaces expert. Jason James. Jason is social search, and he knows uh, a lot about uh, Apple computers. <laughs> he's our Apple. He's an Apple fanboy. Uh, Jackie Jenkins. Jackie is search. And last but not least, Mark Vanegra. So, so what these guys have done is um, they've, they've come up with 20 tips that uh, every one of them is designed to be very actionable and also to have an impact either to your top line, your bottom line, or both. So what we're going to do, if we can get the slides up on the screens, um, we're going to throw a little twist at these guys. We've given them 40 minutes, but what we're going to try to do today is have them go through this in 20 minutes so that we can have you guys, I figured we've got all these experts up here, um, what we can do is if we can go through these relatively quickly, and, and these slides will be available, so don't, don't panic if you're writing this down. Uh, we will make it available. Uh, that's the whole point of this, this session. But what I want to do is try to jam as much into this session as we can in the next 45 minutes. So we're going to try to go through these 20 in about half the time we have, and then we're going to open it up for, for Q&A, uh, and I'll talk about that when we get to it. We'd like to keep that kind of stuff, at, at, again, very tactical. Questions like, I'm selling on eBay and I have this challenge, what's your recommendation? Things, things like that that can, you know, that A, we think that a broad audience could benefit from and that B, that you feel like could be relatively actionable. So with that in mind, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, there's our panel who I've already introduced. So we've got this kind of Vegas style. We're going to reveal the tip as we go. So the first tip. So e-commerce is still growing, but one of the biggest challenges is finding new ways to reach additional um, potential customers and expand your reach. Um, so the idea behind this tip is to very quickly get access to bilingual speakers. Uh, bilingual Spanish-English speakers, according to Google, search half the time in English, uh, but Google doesn't translate your keywords or any of your ads. So you can um, either, in an existing campaign, opt it into uh, Spanish speakers or clone the campaign and add Spanish to that campaign. Track the results. We've seen, um, it's going to depend on your product type and, and certainly what you're doing now, but we've seen this increase um, up to 5 to 10% in terms of traffic uh, with no impact to conversion rate. So we definitely recommend that if you do this, you keep an eye on it because um, it is possible. It could not work as effectively, but we've seen it increase reach pretty dramatically. Second tip. So. Um, during the holidays last year, we recommended that you include your last ship date in your AdWords advertising on your website. Make sure the buyers know when they can buy and when it's too late to get an order in time for the holidays. Well, this actually is a good strategy year round. Uh, shipping is one of the most critical barriers to a sale online. And one of the things that make people kind of panic and realize they don't have enough time to buy something. So if you are always displaying ship times, arrival dates on your website, and even if you go so far as to extend this to all the holidays throughout the year, Mother's Day, Father's Day, um, Halloween, all the holidays where people have definite deadlines and want to make sure they get their orders in on time, if you include on your website information about the last ship date for those holidays, you're more likely to get the conversion. Boom. All right. You guys are doing good on speed. We could always go faster, though. <laughs> I like to Second talk round. too much. <laughs> Uh, so monitor the competition. So, you know, we're hearing that Amazon's growing at 65% with their third-party sellers, and 
that brings a lot of benefit to you having a lot of uh, listings and products for buyers. What that also brings is competition. Uh, and in the fireside chat with Sebastian and Wingo, they talked a bit about price and buyers are always looking for that, that next great deal and the best deal out there. So, you know, when thinking about your pricing strategy, there's a lot that goes into that and figuring out, you know, who are your competitors and how much do you want to drop that price and working with uh, sellers that have large catalogs, that's quite challenging to, to automate that. So what Channel Advisor has done is we have a tool called the Amazon Repricer and you can set your parameters and goals and uh, look at your competition and have those prices automate uh, that price drop for you. Um, and one other thing that we have is this competition watch tool. So, you know, you can look at your competitors and you can look at, okay, what is my SKU? And look at their price. Are they doing FBA? Are they a featured merchant? What's their ratings? And then start to base your strategies off of that. All right, optimize product listing ads. So when product listing ads came out about a year ago, most um, retailers implemented them with one ad group targeting all products. Um, what we've seen over the last year is that, um, first of all, traffic being delivered to product listing ads has increased pretty dramatically. And it's now probably time to revisit that and consider breaking out ad groups with specific um, targets so that you can have more customized ad text um, filtering some products out of your feed so that you're not allowing Google to advertise every single product in your merchant account through a product listing ad. Um, when we've done this for our customers, we've seen the conversion rate as a whole um, actually jump kind of your account average conversion rate. So we're definitely seeing a lot of success, you know, seeing um, a change in conversion rate between 2 and 5% really when we take a look at optimizing them and also um, bidding strategically at the ad group level based on those products targets that you've broken out. Thanks. Round three. <clears throat> All right, create your Google Plus business page. So I think everyone is still um, really kind of trying to wrap their head around social, wrap their head specifically around how to use Google Plus. So what I would say from a very basic starting point is create your page. Um, you can then link your page to your Google AdWords account and uh, enable social extensions through AdWords, which will allow the um, plus one button and you know your kind of tally of plus ones um, to show up on your AdWords ads. Initially, when Google Plus um, rolled out, there was some speculation when social extensions rolled out that there would um, potentially at some point be an element of quality score tied to your um, overall plus ones. While that's not um, anything that you know we can confirm with any certainty at this point, keep in mind that the click-through rate with extensions enabled usually jumps between five and 10%. So given that click-through rate is a huge component of quality score, we believe that this actually is already um, you know, indirectly affecting your quality score. Okay, so what do I mean by evaluating marketplace opportunities at Google? So you've worked really hard potentially. You, may, you have a great website, you worked really hard to optimize your search engine uh, the search engine results so that you end up on page one or page two of the search results. But you've noticed that you're starting to slip further and further down and you're being replaced by marketplaces. As Sears comes online with their marketplace, Next Tag, uh, or Newegg, uh, you know, Walmart, so all these, they're actually pushing you down further. So at some point you may ask yourself, should I be on those marketplaces so that I've got that top position again? So that my product on Newegg is up there at the top of the Google natural search results. So that's one strategy. The other idea is even if those shopping uh, those new marketplaces aren't at the top of that list yet. They may be an opportunity for you to get up there, either jump yourself to page one, which can be very hard in search engine optimization, or just to get yourself up there twice. So you've got your own website, and then you've got your, your same listing on that marketplace. So it's an opportunity to increase sales, uh, increase the number of uh, orders that you get, of course, but also to get a lot more visibility to your business. Okay. Blowing through these, we're going to have a lot of time for questions. So display network optimization. Um, a lot of retailers struggle with making the display network work well for them. Um, typically in a keyword um, search campaign, when you're struggling with ROI, the, you know, the main lever that you can pull is to reduce your bids. Um, so what we would actually recommend with display network is to approach this from the opposite way. Um, in conjunction with managing placements and using negative keywords in your display network campaigns, sometimes actually increasing the bids 
will allow your ads to begin appearing on kind of a higher tier quality-wise of sites on the display network, which in turn have a better ROI. Facebook flash sales. So what we mean by this is you're on Facebook, you've got some fans, and your concern is that your fans aren't engaged. Uh, just because somebody has liked your page, it doesn't mean they're actually seeing your wall posts or seeing your updates. So it's important to engage your users. It's important to remind them of what's going on with you and your business. And a flash sale is one of those ways to engage your users and to get the conversation going. A flash sale would simply be a short amount of time where you've got some special promotion. So people need to react quickly. They need to check out quickly before a limited amount of time is gone or a limited amount of product is sold. And there's a couple different ways you can promote this. You can use our new Facebook campaigns product and update your campaign and have it change to that flash sale, put a post on your wall. The other thing you could use is the events inside of Facebook itself. So you create an event, it's got a time <coughs> and a, a start and end time. And so you create that event in Facebook, all of your fans will see that event get created on, on their events when they log into Facebook. And so then they can more or less subscribe or, or say they're going. When the event starts, they can come in save some money, and engage with your brand. So it's a, uh, it's a neat way and kind of a fun way to keep people who like your products engaged with you on Facebook. Great. Round five. All right, progressive remarketing. So a lot of people have probably tried remarketing. One of the challenges is really to understand um, the timing of it, how do you kind of make the most of it in, in terms of um, you know, running those campaigns if you don't have someone come back right away. So what we recommend doing is actually creating two custom lists. One that's going to use a shorter cookie and that's gonna allow you to target people who have been on your site and didn't make a purchase. If that doesn't work, you can create the second list which will then say it's, you know, it's further out from the initial point that they were on your website. So I'm gonna offer them something a little bit more incentivizing to come back. So what you'll do is set that up with a longer cookie window, exclude the first list if they've already converted, and bring them back with something more aggressive. Um, and what we're seeing when we have these set up is that they actually have a similar conversion rate as far as 60 days out from being the initial kind of experience on your website as a lot of the remarketing that's taking place and happening you know, a day or two after. So we're not really seeing the same um, element of time decay. So it's important to get users on your site and to give them information about the products that they're purchasing and information about you as a retailer. A great way to do this is to do video product reviews. Uh, what we mean by this is you get a new product and people are curious about how it works and so you can explain either an unboxing, through an unboxing, through a setup, through a review of the features and functions, the strengths and weaknesses of the product. Put that in a video, put it on your website and add it to YouTube. So basically embed a YouTube video onto that product page or onto that category page or even your home page. When you do this, you create a link back to YouTube which can drive traffic. You engage users more. They're more likely to convert because they have a much better understanding of that product. And they're also less likely to return it because there's gonna be fewer surprises at the other end. And finally, it presents you more as an expert. So if you visit sites, there's uh, great sites out there about how to pick a espresso maker, which can be an incredibly daunting task if you've ever tried to do this. And <clears throat> one site in particular reviews every single espresso maker they sell and has got tremendous uh, return customers, uh, recommendations from other users. And so I know that this can work and help your business if you start to add video product reviews to your website. Round six. So evaluate Amazon FBA. So uh, anyone that was sitting in Wingo's keynote heard him talk about the Costco analogy and the number of stores uh, compared to Amazon's warehouse. There's definitely prediction of growth there and seeing a lot more of that uh, moving forward this year and uh, into next year. So we're seeing a lot more folks uh, talk about the FBA and start evaluating it. And I think the reasons there is that Again, it's being more competitive on Amazon. So you've got the Super Saver, you've got Amazon Prime. Um, and to be part of that, you know, you need to, with the Amazon FBA, it will allow you to have that, which then gives you um, that free shipping, which can bump you up in uh, that price competitiveness uh, to help win the buy box. I think another thing we're hearing a lot about is, you know, going international. Again, Wingo talked a bit about that, and I think um, there's some risk in, in doing that from the fulfillment side, so having uh, Amazon do that for you and kind of slow rolling into some of these new marketplaces can give you 
that advantage and, and help. The other key thing is that with doing the Amazon FBA, um, you know, they're handling all of the fulfillment customer service returns, so any kind of negative feedback that comes from that is going to be struck through and won't affect your uh, performance. Amy, um, so let's say I have a bunch of products I'm selling on Amazon third party. What are good candidates for FBA? How do you help people think about that? Yeah, so it's kind of uh, the other interesting thing too with that is that you don't have to do everything FBA, right? So you can kind of pick and choose what makes sense for you. So if you have maybe certain products that um, are challenging for you to ship um, or you have a hard time meeting those shipment requirements and that handling time or that lead time to ship, you know, those may be good products to then consider to hand over to Amazon and let them handle it. I don't know how many times the word Pinterest has been uttered on this stage so far, but it seems like about 3,000. Scott talked about it, Jeff talked about it, Doug talked about the importance of Pinterest uh, to his business going forward. And one of the things that was brought up is how difficult it was to predict the rise of this site. And I think that that's definitely gonna continue. Um, and it's easy to see that retailers and brands are having trouble recognizing um, when these sites are becoming important. If you go to Pinterest.com slash Nike, you'll see that site belongs to uh, someone named Nicole E. You go to Pinterest.com slash Donna Karen, it belongs to some random person named Donna Karen. Um, the bottom line is, um, going forward, it's going to be increasingly difficult to identify which sites are going to be interesting. If you're not already on Pinterest specifically, I would suggest going out today or as quickly as you can and claiming your, your company's name. Um, I would also recommend claiming any sort of variants. Um, for example, I talked about Dar Donna Karen. Uh, I also checked DKNY. That belongs to someone named Dina Corman, who may or may not live in New York. <laughs> <coughs> Anytime you see an article about a new one of these sites, it may already be too late, so jump on it. If you read TechCrunch or The Verge or a site like that, uh, anyone that's getting press is probably getting some traction, and therefore it would make sense to go take five minutes to register for it, and then hopefully after that actually spend some time looking at it. Although I wouldn't recommend posting under your brand and then stopping. If you're going to engage in a social networking site of any kind, make it consistent. Have you secured Mark Vandegrift? Uh, yes. Okay, good. Thank goodness. I own my brand on Pinterest. <laughs> Don't want any brand confusion there around that one. Number seven. So I talked earlier about acquisition and how it's becoming more challenging. Uh, when you do acquire a customer, you need to do everything you can to make sure that customer converts. And one of the things that's become um, very popular uh, among some retailers and, and brands who are selling online is to, <clears throat> after someone leaves the cart, um, abandons the cart with a product in it, try to communicate to them uh, additional opportunities for revisiting that cart and hopefully buying that product. It's hard to know why someone left a cart. It could be a technology issue. Um, they could just want to think about it longer, or you know, maybe they're on AT&T and their signal dropped. Um, <clears throat> it happens to me a lot, I can tell you. <laughs> um, so sending them an email um, afterwards, kind of reminding them, hey, you, know, you can come back. Um, we'll save your, the product in the cart for you. Here's a link if, if your system supports it. Um, obviously, you have to collect the email address. I would recommend doing that as early in the checkout as possible, or if they've registered already, it's going to be a lot easier. You can also remind them. Um, about a wish list function if you have one. Um, bottom line is, like I said, acquisition is getting harder, so every time you acquire someone, you have to do whatever you can to, to turn that person into a converter. All right, thanks. So provide UPCs. You know, we're uh, already seeing, you know, Amazon already has their, their catalog and having that single user experience where you can come to a product page and see a number of, of different sellers. <coughs> we're seeing that on eBay as well where they're having the catalog with the GPS and some of the other ca uh, categories that are rolling out with Buy.com. And then now you've got Sears and Newegg that are also trying to look to match to a product listing page to, again, keep that user experience. So. What we're seeing with some of the sellers is you know, making sure that they have that data that is going to be able to properly match to those uh, catalog pages um, and making sure that they have the accurate data. So not even just the UPCs, but also having the brand and the manufacturer and those key components to help you match to that. And then making sure that you're, you're running a check against that, that there are, everything is mapping up as it should and, and you're not running into those mismatches. So Channel Advisor has a number of different things that we're doing today with the mismatch, if you're in on any of the pre-conference sessions, we uh, talked a bit about that. So making sure you've got those UPCs, you're mapping to the catalog, and you're checking that they're mapping appropriately. Okay. Round eight. Retailers who don't encourage all feedback wind up encouraging only negative feedback. This came up uh, in the context of Amazon earlier when Sebastian was on stage. 
Um, but this tip is more about the, the larger space, specifically comparison shopping engine reviews. Uh, but there are other providers that are non-CSE oriented, like resellerratings.com. Um, Google aggregates all these and uh, displays them in Google product search. They can also be put on AdWords. Uh, but they're also just out there across CSE and all these other sites that could be found by users pretty easily. Um, so it's definitely, aware to, uh, it's definitely important to be aware of what your ratings are. You can uh, query your brand on Google and try to, um, in Google product search and try to see what they're aggregating in terms of ratings, what sources they're coming from. Um, if you don't have any ratings or you have negative ratings, I definitely think you should take action uh, to try to encourage people to leave ratings. And you can do that through some of the CSEs. Not all of them require you to advertise in order to use their rating system, like BizRate, for example. Um, and we've seen on, within the context of comparison shopping engines specifically, that having higher ratings can definitely have a positive impact on activity. We had one consumer electronics retailer on Price Grabber specifically um, a year or so ago. Their ratings were about two and a half out of five. They were not encouraging ratings by using the Price Grabber uh, system. Um, within a month or so, they were able to get it up over four stars, and we saw a 30% increase in traffic and sales. Great. I always get a question on this one about the reseller ratings folks. People ask, I think they have a, almost a pay-to-play kind of a model. So people That's say, correct. is there a good ROI there? Um, what, what's your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, I'm <laughs> Try to be I guess nice. more the mindset of you know, being afraid of what happens if you don't pay-to-play. Um, I don't know exactly what the pricing model is or the price range is. I don't think it's ridiculously expensive, so I would suggest at least looking into it and seeing if you can afford it. Um, the nice thing is they do allow you to respond to the negatives and, and kind of take ownership of the, the issues. Yeah, so Google seems to over-index them for whatever reason. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. And so that leads right into uh, the seven of hearts, which would be reputation <laughs> and management. Um, and, you know, <laughs> As you start to embrace these social networks, you have to be more concerned about your reputation. At the simple side, if you will, is the, you know, the star rating system you see in CSEs, but when you go out into social networks, there's gonna be more communication with your buyers, and frankly, it's not all gonna be positive. So you need to keep on top of that. Um, if you follow Mark's advice, which is great advice, to go out there and embrace all these new social networks and social channels as they come out, you also need to at least keep one eye on them. The caveat is you need to at least keep your eye out there because if it turns into a place for people to kvetch about customer service or ship times or other kinds of problems, then you've got a customer service problem on your hands. And you do want to own that conversation or at least be an equal partner in that conversation with your buyers and your fans. So having a reputation management program is in part keeping your eye on these different channels and making sure that your reputation is, is, is not being um, you know, denigrated. So that's part of it. The other thing is you want to improve your reputation over time. You want to grow your fan base. You want to increase the number of people who follow your Twitter feed. So set goals, figure out where you are today, and set goals and track those over time. How many, you know, how many fans do you have on your Twitter feed today? How many do you hope to have next month or the month after that? Of course, you always want to set realistic goals, but aggressive goals as well. So it's important to have a reputation management program that goes along with your sort of you know, ROI goals and goes along with your uh, total sales goals. So think of it as, as yet a, a kind of a, another thing that you should be keeping an eye on, another thing you should be managing performance based on. So reputation management, think about it. Yeah, there's a ton of products out there. Most of them are free or very inexpensive to help you do this, like things like Hootsuite, Bitly, TweetDeck that they, they enable you from one central console to monitor many Twitter accounts, your Facebook account, and, and whatever is going on on all these different networks. So um, you can do this manually, but as it scales up, you may want to look at some of those tools for doing that. There's yep. also technology like Tracker that actually tries to read whether they're positive or negative comments and give you feedback on those. Ladder. Software called Tracker was actually started by a guy in the Raleigh area. Spell it. It's got a weird spelling. Yeah, it's T R A. C-K-R? I don't know. U-R. T-R-A-C-K-U-R. Yeah, it's, it's either missing a vowel or it has a weird vowel. Something. Yeah. <laughs> and, and do, and These don't names forget, make you pull your hair out. And don't forget about Facebook Insights, too. So every time you post <clears throat> on your wall on Facebook, you can see how much engagement that drove, and you can see the trends over time. Yep. That's within the Facebook ad system that you, go, you log in and see that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so provide one-day handling and tracking. So uh, Sebastian quoted earlier, uh, base strategies on things that won't change. Uh, I think of three things that come to mind. One is price. Buyers always want a good deal. I mentioned that earlier. Two is fast and free shipping. And three is great customer service. So kind of ties nicely with this in that you know, you're seeing um, a lot of the marketplaces starting to push the one-day handling and tracking. You know, eBay specifically now is you know, coming in June. 
um, talking about having that 90% of tracking uploaded to your account to keep that top rated seller status. Also then giving you that boost in eBay match and giving you that final discount fee. So, you know, making sure that you're thinking about if you're not already doing one day handling time, you know, how can I work with my fulfillment center to do that so I can have these added benefits and have that great customer service. Uh, and then making sure that you're having that great communication with your buyers. Uh, part of that is then having that tracking that buyers can follow through. Okay. And then what's eBay's new rule about the one day handling? You, you have the, the tracking is 90%. Um, is it also 90% for the one day handling? Yeah, so it's 90% within the uh, time frame that you put for your handling time. The one day handling time, you know, if you start thinking about your DSRs and, you know, how you can boost up your five star ratings there, um, you can get an automatic five star. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> All right, everyone is in a race uh, to go mobile, and if you weren't prior to this conference, you probably will be rushing home to get your mobile sites going after this. Um, so my tip is really to make sure before you pay to acquire traffic on your mobile site, make sure that it's a website that can be navigated, the checkout process is seamless. Basically make sure it works on a mobile device. So there's this really great tool um, offered by Google at the URL www.howtogomo.com that will allow you to preview what your website looks like on a smartphone. It kind of does a, an evaluation of your website and determines whether or not it considers it to be a mobile optimized site. It will provide you some tips for making changes if there, there are required changes. Um, and additionally, if you don't have a mobile site, you can create one through the tool or you can contract with um, some providers that can create a mobile site for you. Um, Could you so say would, the URL one more time? Yes, yeah, sorry. The URL is www.howtogomo.com. Just M-O? Yes. Not mobile. How to go mo. Yep. Dot com. And not MOE, that's the restaurant. So. Right, not But if, you're, if you want a burrito, Grill. you can do how to go to Mo's, but this is more about mobile. Yeah. Welcome we'll to do Mo's. That later. <clears throat> I had a tip earlier about acquisition. I had a tip about conversion. This one is about retention. Um, I like this because it's inherently personal, it's very simple. Um, and I can tell it's effective because I've seen it impact my own credit card and my own bottom line. My wife um, is a big anthropology fan, and for five years she's gotten uh, via email around her birthday a coupon code for some percentage off, and she has executed on that 100% of the time. <laughs> one idea and I she had, has four birthdays a year. Go figure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and what, they they seem to give consistent um, consistent discounts. Um, one thing I thought might be interesting, and this is definitely something you want to make optional, um, this whole idea you want to make optional in your checkout system to have people enter their birthdays. But if they do happen to enter their year, it might make sense to give them a, a bigger discount on big birthdays, like their 40th birthday, for example. Okay, cool. So buy.com, merchant storefront. So <laughs> we're seeing uh, a lot of folks, you know, start to, they've already got their eBay and Amazon um, marketplaces established and they're looking to go out to buy. And one thing we're kind of in talking with sellers, I hear them say, well, how can I, you know, increase my revenue? How can I increase my average order value? Um, and so one thing that we're, we're talking with them about is making sure that you have an Amazon storefront. Um, it's free. Amazon or uh, buy.com is also as of February. If you want to get the buy button, uh, you need to have a storefront. So. The importance of having that storefront uh, helps keep buyers in your store, continuing to shop, adding things um, to their cart. Also gives you the option to then drive traffic to that store. So having that uh, marketing capability to, um, with the emails, you know, if you're working with buy on any kind of promotional opp opportunities, they're going to require you to have that storefront. Um, and again, to have that, that buy button, I think is a big piece. And then also you have on all the listings, there'll be a visit store. So, you know, if buyers land on that page, they can then click on that visit store and then have that same good experience within your store uh, in finding products. Okay. So this recaps the tips. Let's give these guys a round of applause. I crammed their time by half, in fact, so thanks guys. All right, if you have questions, we have four microphone runners. Uh, so microphone folks, hold your hands up. What we're going to do is instead of having those guys run, which eats up a lot of time, if you could kind of get in line near the one that's closest to you with your questions, um, raise your hands, come on, just raise, flail around, guys. Um, then they will, that will make it easier for us to get a lot of questions in. 
we always have a very interactive audience here at Catalyst, so don't be shy. All right, we have a question lined up yet? There's people milling around over here thinking about questions. All right, go ahead. If you could, uh, so if you could say your name, your company, um, and the category you sell in, uh, and then your question, that, that, that would kind of help give us a little bit of a framework. Okay, my name is Eddie Cortez. Our company is, is uh, EC World, and we sell both luggage business cases and home decor. Okay. And we're considering uh, doing the Amazon uh, fulfillment by um, Amazon. And one of the questions that we have is uh, if we submit uh, products to Amazon, will Amazon take care of the shipping cost from the Amazon warehouse to the, the customer? Okay, so the, the question is, they're, they're, he's selling luggage. This is going to be a question for Amy. Okay. Um, and right now you're, you're selling on Amazon third party, it sounds like. That's correct. Yep, um, and had some success there, and now you're considering FBA. And the question is, does Amazon cover the cost? So, so there's two shipments that happen. You ship product to Amazon, so that's, let's call that number one, and then they ship it to the consumer. That's correct. Uh, on number one, I'll answer that. What's nice about number one is you ship to Amazon on their rate card. Um, so you actually probably be the cheapest shipping you ever do in bulk is, is um, that one leg. And then the second leg, I'll let Amy, Amy handle that. Yeah, so they'll handle that, and you'll pay uh, Amazon for that, uh, for your product. So you'll pay for, uh, based on the storage, the weight, and um, the packing and shipping. So I think all of that, then they would cover. Yep, and there's a per order, and then they, per order, yes. I believe they take care of the, the prime shipping cost. Yes, um, yes. And you pay your per order part yes. of that. Okay, so, so basically we're, we're, we wouldn't be responsible to uh, uh, reimburse Amazon for that shipping, that final that final leg to the customer. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe that you're you're paying to ship it to them, and then they're ha handling it from then on out. Great. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's go back there. Could you comment on best? Uh, uh, so, if you could say your name. Yes. Company name and category. Yeah. So Alpa with eBay. Okay. Yeah. What category you do you sell in? <laughs> You're supposed to say all of them. All of them, exactly. Okay. This is going to be for Mark V, I can already tell. Go ahead. Yeah. All right, what's your question? Yeah, so could you comment a little bit about the use of discounts by sellers? Uh, it's, it, you know, everyone's giving discounts. It's the easiest thing in the world to do in, in some ways, except it impacts the bottom line negatively. So what are some best practices around how to use discounts, when to use them? Okay. Anyone want to jump in on that one? The first thing I would suggest is don't stop using discounts if they're effective until after we see what happens with JCPenney. JCPenney just changed their pricing model very significantly. They, they used to train people to wait until there were big discounts, and now they're going forward with this almost Walmart-like every, everyday low pricing message. So I, I, my suggestion is to let them be the guinea pig and wait a quarter or so, see what their uh, financial results are like. Um, in terms of specifics, it's going to depend very significantly on what your acquisition costs are like, how good you are at retaining customers, whether your site converts well. So pinning down specifics is, is really difficult in general. Um, again, I think it really depends on how your customers behave. Yeah. So I would suggest testing a lot. That's, that's really the, the, a vague but the real, realistic answer to really any question like this is your customers, your products, your business are different than everyone else's, and just because it works for someone else doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Yeah, there's a really broad spectrum of what retailers do. You have some retailers that have been, you know, everything's a discount, and then you have others that don't do discounts at all. JCPenney is kind of making the most abrupt movement there. Uh, and then one that I think is interesting is Zappos. Zappos, uh, they have the Zappos brand, and, and if you Google Zappos coupon code, you'll find that they have an explicit statement that says, we do not have coupon codes, period, and if you find one, it's probably fraudulent. So, so that's pretty, that's another extreme. But then what they do is they have this sub-brand, and that's where they liquidate, and, and they actually discount on that sub-brand. Um, some folks use some of the different channels. So you're from eBay. Uh, a lot of our, one popular uh, usage that we're finding with larger brands for eBay is to have eBay as your outlet. Um, and that's nice because you're not cannibalizing your own customer base by discounting on your site. You're effectively discounting on eBay, um, and, and that's exposing your products to a different audience and, and more of a value-oriented audience. And the icing on the cake is you're acquiring those customers that you can then bring to your mainland, your mainline non-discount brand. So those are some of the, the strategies we've seen out there, and, and there's a broad spectrum to look at. Uh, let's go with this gentleman who's been very patient. 
It's uh, Brad Howard with Trend Nation. We sell uh, in about 20 different categories, uh, clothing accessories primarily. Uh, my question is around Amazon. We sell uh, very successfully on Amazon, have over 100,000 customers. Um, our challenge is that eBay gives us the email of the customer, and Amazon conveniently doesn't give you the email of the customer. Uh, so once we actually have made the sale and have shipped the box and put our promo code in the box to come back to our website, 99% uh, of the time they don't respond to it. We have no ways to reaching out to that customer. Um, what we've been talking about internally is actually setting up a caller or having someone in the office actually call the phone numbers of all of our Amazon customers, thank them for their business, ask them how their experience was, and then let them know about a promo or, or code that we could offer them on our own site to shop directly with us. Uh, is that going to get me in hot water with Amazon? Um, and <laughs> Where's Sebastian when you need him? <laughs> uh, so so the, uh, increasingly, um, and eBay has been very flexible on this, and, and we, we sense that they're going to be less and less flexible. This would be a good question uh, for any of the eBay folks that, that you run into. Um, they, they've always had this project on the table to anonymize emails, and, and they've turned it on and off. I always forget if it's on or off right now. Do you know? The what? The anonymization of eBay emails? Uh, I'm not sure. They give you emails now. Okay. So, so they, it's their desire not to give you emails over time. So, so you'll see. So, if Amazon's here, eBay's going to rise to that level of, of obfuscating you from the customer um, and viewing you as more of a dropship partner than kind of a, hey, we're going to let these people kind of share our customers and peel them off the marketplace. Um, so, to, so, to answer your specific question, will that get you in hot water with Amazon? De you, kind of depends on if you get caught or not, you know? <laughs> so, you know, my advice is to be. The, when you, if you get kicked off Amazon, 99% of the time it is a, uh, you know, it is forever. And so, uh, if Amazon is a big part of your business, I would be very, very cautious there. So, so I would, I would not push that envelope. I would stay within the guidelines. You know, try to build a brand. And people on the internet are smart. They're going to know that okay, I bought from this seller named X. And they're going to go Google that and find your website. You know, or they're just enter a .com. So, so making sure you, you kind of tie all that together will get you most of the way towards what you're wanting to do. Um, and then I would, I would take that amount of effort you're trying to put into acquiring customers off Amazon, and I would put it into channels like search, that that, that is the, what you're doing there in comparison shopping. Um, and because if you get in hot water with Amazon, you're pretty much toast. And, and it is very hard to get out of that situation. OK, uh, you don't have questions. Uh, is there a question back in the left there? Or you just ask the photographer guy? OK, uh, over here to the right, do you have a question? Nope, just a guy standing around. Any other questions? Last call. Okay, well, hopefully we answered everyone's question. Oh, sure, I'll just repeat it. Yep. How do you discount? Yeah. How do you break the rules? <laughs> okay, let, let me restate the question. So, so, so these folks here, um, they sell a product. They're in the collectibles category, but they have something called map pricing. Uh, raise your hand. Everyone understands map pricing, I think. Um, uh, and you know, every everyone has kind of ways around getting around this, and, and a lot of it depends on your your strength of relationship and how much hot water you'll get in with your supplier. So Amazon is very powerful, and what they do is everyone's seen this, where you go to the page and it says add to cart to see the price. What Amazon's doing there is effectively getting around map pricing by saying, we did not advertise the price. The consumer had an intent to purchase because they added the item to the cart. Therefore, so, therefore it wasn't advertising, which is what the A in map stands for, it's minimum advertised price. And then we showed them a lower discounted price. Um, so that's how Amazon gets around it. And, and the, they mentioned they're selling on eBay. Um, so a couple ideas. So I, I know eBay has gotten a lot of feedback on this and has work, worked on, um, They've gotten a lot of feedback about what they call strikeout pricing, which would be a very similar kind of a thing to what I just said. And, and eBay has a cart now, so they'll at some point be able to do something like that. Um, if that doesn't work for you, another thing we've seen is um, where you can, you can implement a feature on eBay called best offer. And that's where you, know, you, you have a product for $9.99, and then someone could submit an, a price, you know, an offer for $9.80. Now, when you put best offer on there, you know, there's a downside to that. You're signaling, hey, I'll take offers. And you're going to get all kinds of crazy folks saying, I'll buy it for a dollar and things like that. So um, uh, we actually have features in our software that will kind of filter through that and say, here's reasonable offers, automatically accept them. Here's questionable ones, let's think about them. And then here's ones that are kind of crazy, just immediate reject them. 
Um, any other ideas there? Another, you know, on the broader internet, you can use coupon codes kind of generally for your store to get around some of that stuff. Um, you know, you'll find that brands are pretty good at catching up with that. If you go to um, eBags is a good example. They're, they're a customer of ours, and whenever they put out a coupon code, they have to put a lot of words around that that say, this does not work for North Face, for Toomey, because those guys have caught on that coupon codes are a way to get around map pricing. Um, so, so hopefully that gives you some ideas. You know, if you're on eBay, I think the best idea is the best offer functionality. And you can selectively put, you don't have to put best offer on everything either. You can selectively put it on whatever products you want to kind of, a, kind of suggest that there's a discount for this product. Another thing that um, happens a lot in the electronics world is this concept of bundling. So let's say I'm selling an Olympus camera and I've got map pricing on that camera of $299. Well, what I'll do is I'll take a bunch of other things. I'll create an Olympus camera starter kit. I'll take a tripod, a lens case, a filter pack, some cleaner, uh, and I don't know, a feather back scratcher. And I'll put it all together in a bundle. And I will call, now call that bundle 325. So I know that what I've effectively done is I've discounted the camera in that bundle um, pretty substantially, but I haven't really advertised that I've discounted that camera in that bundle. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like the super value meal at McDonald's. Everyone knows that if you added up the component parts, you're saving a lot of money, but you don't know exactly, really know where was the, the burger that was discounted or was it the fries or the drink? I don't, I don't really know. So, so you're kind of doing that. You're obfuscating the discount in a bundle. Um, and, you know, in collectibles, there could be, there's a lot of ways to bundle things around, uh, you know, let's say you're doing Christmas collectibles. You could do like a, you know, a little holiday starter kit thing and include their little accessories are a great way to do this also because they're high margin and you can, you can discount them pretty effectively as well. All right. Uh, one last question in the back left. Hi, Scott. Hi. Erica Boyle from Street Moda. Oh, we here do, comes trouble. Um, <laughs> thanks. Uh, All right, she's we're going to end Q&A right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that you're doing a lot of push towards shopping comparison, which is absolutely fantastic. But what suggestions do you have for those of us that are on Amazon and don't want to sacrifice that business? Nine times out of ten, Amazon is, we're going to be competing against ourselves on Amazon. And I think in their contract, I think it's section 4.4, um, we are not allowed to have a lower price on our website, including shipping and promotions, than it is on Amazon. So other than taking off the item from Amazon and solely selling it on our website, what best practices do you have for us to get that traffic to our site? Okay. Um, in, in my keynote, I talked about shelf space. So, so just because you have something on Amazon, and let's say it's $9.99, um, these guys sell apparel, um, and it's a $9.99 t-shirt, just because you have it on comparison shopping for $9.99 doesn't mean the consumer is not going to go that path. And, and in fact, you're going to have, because it's showing up via Amazon as $9.99 and you as $9.99, your, your, your coverage of that result within a comparison shopping engine, within a Google result, goes up. It effectively doubles if you've gone from one to two. So, so, so that's kind of how we think about it, not just the pure pricing aspect of it, but, but more coverage. Do you want to throw anything in there? Well, I, I really think that that question ties to some of the other questions we've had about discounting uh, the map pricing. Um, and in my opinion, they all kind of tie together about the concept of value. And I mentioned in my, one of my pre-conference sessions yesterday, I think everyone shops based on value. They just define it in different ways. And so if you can't differentiate yourself on price, you need to try to differentiate yourself on something else, whether it's you know, customer service or um, other content on your site or the concepts, some of the newer concepts that were talked about during the One King's Lane presentation, like curation. Um, people do think, you know, they assign value to some of these things. And um, I, I, like I said earlier about, you know, my wife, I see her not always buy the cheapest thing, even though I know she's a pretty cheap lady, to be honest. Um, well, that sounds really condescending. Um, <clears throat> but the reality is um, God, some, of these other aspects, yeah. <laughs> some of these other aspects do have, um, you know, do, do have value to them, and, and people see different, you know, differentiation in that way. And uh, you know, not everyone buys the cheapest thing. We we have uh, brands listing on comparison shopping engines um, who have you know 20 percent, 30 percent higher prices than um, than some of their retail distribution network partners, and they still sell you know tens of thousands of dollars of their products through comparison shopping engines. And that's users who are raising their hand and saying, "Hey, I'm price sensitive because I'm coming to a comparison shopping engine." So even those some subset of those people are seeing some value in the concept of. You know, either just buying directly from the manufacturer, or maybe they just trust them more. There, there are other aspects out there besides price, and I think focusing on those could help. Yeah, consumers have infinite 
entry paths into your products, and, and everyone kind of thinks about how they shop, but you take something like Shopzilla, they distribute their products to Home Shopping Network, and someone could have been watching a Home Shopping Network show, gone to the site, and then <laughs> found your product, and, and that would have been a sale you would have never gotten if you were just on Amazon or on your own website. Um, so we're, we're out of time. Let's give another round of applause to these guys, and thanks for your questions. Thanks, guys.